How's it going? Sure, absolutely. Tim Lewis. Isaac Lloyd. Nice to meet you, Isaac. Um, do you mind holding this? Yeah, absolutely. We can do that. And can you tell me about this guy? Absolutely. Yeah, how much time do you have? How, how deep do you want to go? Uh, I want to go so deep. Okay. However, I want to be respectful of people who don't want to go as deep. Sure. Um, All right. So how that's... about that? Let me give you the quick overview then. So. Uh, my name is Tim Lewis, engineer here with John Deere. I uh, work specifically here on our commercial mower uh, that we have here today. So a couple things I'd like to point out to you here. So first, it is fully battery electric. So what we have Can I is, stand on it? Yeah, absolutely. You can hop on the back there. While you're there, I'll point out a couple of things here too. Obviously, this can run autonomously, which is really exciting. Um, what Isaac is showing here too is that it has manual capability. So. You may need that to get it on and off the trailer. Uh, we also use that to map our boundaries as well. So you can go around the exterior, map your boundary for where you want to operate in, and then leverage Op Center from there uh, to customize your path plans um, and make any edits that you need from there. Okay. How fast does it go? So uh, in manual, you can go up to about 10 miles an hour. We're targeting nice. Usually a typical mow speed is about five to six miles per hour for mowing. Okay, so is it, is, it, is it maxed out at a certain speed in autonomous mode? Typically, yep. Okay, this thing is freaking huge. This is the biggest robotic mower I've ever seen. Is yeah. it safe? Absolutely. Yeah, Absolutely, so, that's... Yeah, what we, okay. what we focus on for, for deer is safety first. Okay. So everything that we do from the way the machine's constructed uh, to the obstacle detection system, you'll, you may notice as if you were to walk around the machine, We've got four pairs of cameras to give us 360 degree obstacle detection capability around the machine. Uh, so we do as much as possible to look at safety, identifying objects, uh, to be able to operate safely in those environments. Okay, so you got you got two cameras here. What are these? These are just lights? Yep, so those are indicator lights. Um, you may notice there's some of it on the microsite to look at video. You might notice it when it comes up here. Okay. Um, these are teal lights. Um, and those are to indicate that it's functioning autonomously, so you can okay. tell from a distance, hey, this thing's running. Uh, we also have amber on there as well to flash and just kind of be like a general caution of, hey, the machine's operating, um, okay. you know, kind of watch out. And then acreage capacity, and then how would this fit into, I'm, I'm more in the consumer space. Yep. Um, so, but I'm, I am very interested in the commercial applications. Yep. Um, so how would this fit into an everyday commercial mowing operation? Yeah. So. As you rightly noted, this is really going to be slanted more for commercial uh, applications for this. Covering, uh, you might cover about 20 acres or so uh, with one of these machines on a charge. Um, so you can cover some decent amount of ground, especially if you were leveraging. That is an uh, indecent multiple. amount of ground. Well, <laughs> 20 acres on a single charge. Yep. Uh, and then, do you have like a metric like acres per hour or anything like that? Uh, it really depends on what your operation's at. So. Um, you know, it may be a couple of acres per hour, depending on how efficiently it's able to get around there. Um, it may increase over that if you've got some more wide open areas and you're just kind of not doing a lot of turns and running straight out. Okay, okay, okay. So is this something that they'll, you know, a commercial operator would drop it off at a property, let it mow? Maybe they have three of them on a trailer? What's kind of your target application scenario? Yeah, I think we've seen a lot of different applications about how it might be used. Um, some customers that we've talked to have indicated they probably will set up autonomous crews so instead of seeing um, maybe this run alongside gas machines for instance they probably would set up to run these now really what we're seeing from a labor standpoint is that they want to have this as like a labor multiplication so right, right, take right. that job of mowing away from the crew and they can focus on the other jobs that are around the property because uh, what may not always be so obvious is you certainly have to get the grass cut, but then there's trimming, uh, pruning the oh, yeah. trees, cleaning up mulch beds, where humans really need to go over and do that work. For now. And this can be taken, well, yeah, <laughs> for now. someday we can take care of that too. <laughs> it's, um, it's several years in the future though, for sure. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, but this can be doing the work of mowing um, and help the crew members that they do have uh, to be able to do that other work around the property. And maybe not quit as much. I mean, I, I imagine this is a mind numbing task for, I mean, it numbs my mind cutting my grass, so. Yeah. Um, it, what are the pain points you've heard from commercial operators that, that you're specifically targeting for this, like actual story? Like what, I assume you did some market research and oh, yeah. you, you heard the, the cries of woe. About yeah, <laughs> yeah. So uh, you will hear it throughout the booth uh, that's here and it's actually a, a quite a significant challenge across most of uh, the customers that we serve and it's really finding labor. 
Um, so what we're highlighting too is it's not that we're trying to replace humans. Uh, it's really filling labor gaps that are there. Um, so I'll give you an example of a, a government uh, customer that uh, we interviewed. They have budget for two crew members and they're maintaining a whole park. Well, what they find is those uh, operators that they have spend a lot of their time mowing and they're not able to get to the rest of the groundskeeping. And what they found is, boy, if we could have the time of the mower um, operation taken away from them, well, then they can focus on maintaining the rest of the property and that whole property quality increases. Yeah, yeah. So that's you, really what they're looking to do. Yeah, I'm making connections in my head because like if, yep. I, if I had to sit on this thing, you know, for three hours mowing a park, yep. by the time I'm done, I don't feel like doing really detailed work around the edges and like prettying up the flower beds or, or you know, picking up sticks or whatever. Yep. So I, I can definitely see that. Yep. Especially when uh, you can imagine Texas, Florida, a lot of those big markets that are down there. It gets pretty hot in the summer. And oh, yeah. where are you? Out in the middle of the open field, taking the sun all day. Uh, it's it's a grueling job. So I was talking to Brad yesterday a little bit, at the very end of the day, and he had mentioned you'd done like paid pilot programs. How many of those have you done? What has been the feedback that you get from people that are actually using this in operation? Yeah, so this one we're not quite as far along in development, but that's definitely some things that we're doing right now is to get in front of more customers with the product and leveraging that to get the feedback. Now, other parts of the program that we've uh, been able to leverage, we've gotten a lot of positive feedback um, from them. I think they're excited to see that, that Deer is coming uh, with a product like this. Um, so it's been pretty positive. All right, well, let's talk about some negatives. I like asking hard questions. I'm actually yeah. an engineer as well. Okay, so, there, hey, there we go. <laughs> um, oh, shoot, and now I already forgot my, uh, my harder question. Um, what, what, what are some of the biggest challenges you guys are facing right now with implementation? Yeah, I think, you know, it, it's as much a good thing as a bad thing. Uh, there is so much capability that autonomy can go after. Um, it's really finding like, what do we want to start with? What are the first problems that we okay. want to solve? Because you can imagine all the different scenarios that we'd like to accomplish. Graveyards, um, golf courses, like, yeah, so many things. Yeah, hillsides, uh, highways, I mean, everything, right? Yeah. Um, and they've all got their own nuances and challenges and all of that, so it's really finding uh, the right way to start and tailor all that. And I think we're on a great path to do that. So um, what's your target? What are you focused on? Yeah, what we really want to focus on uh, to start is being able to get into uh, those high productivity areas to hit hit that labor gap as hard as we can, and then work on expanding in more of those nuanced areas to be able to keep expanding capability. So would it be safe to say you're targeting as many acres as possible? Or, or do you use a different metric to, in order to, to I, I think acres would, would be a good one to use. Um, so what we want to do is we have a lot of customer information from lots of people actively using mowers, not necessarily autonomous, of course, uh, to be able to look at that. And that's what we want to do is to be able to find the right ways to say how do we accomplish as much of our customer base as possible as we launch this. Okay. I remember my other question. Um, and this is, this is more of an assumption. Um, you know, there are other lawn implement uh, manufacturers, um, hand tools. I don't want to say the actual manufacturer's name because, yep. you know. <laughs> um, but I think in general, I've noticed that there are two or I think there's basically three types of, of uh, companies that are getting into this. They're either um, people who are already in the lawn mowing industry and they're trying to come out with a robot. Um, it's uh, a, robo a robot company that is coming out with a lawnmower and I've been very pleased with the quality there. Um, and then just people who are just, you know, college grads or whatever, they want to do a startup and they've got the skills and they're trying to hack together a team. And they come up with some really cool stuff, so I don't want to discount that at all. Yeah. Um, I do so far seem to have, I, I seem to perceive that companies, and I think this may be ignorance, but I would consider John Deere not to be a robotics company. Um, so how have you kind of managed that shift and ensured that you had the talent, I guess, to to actually come out with something that works, not just now, but you're able to continue to innovate and encourage um, people to contribute to the project. Yeah, awesome question. So a couple of things to highlight. I think what's exciting about Deer doing this is we get to start from that foundational part of, uh, we know the equipment and we know our application really well. Uh, when we start our projects, it's always starting with the customer. So you may have actually met um, Russell if you came in yesterday with the orchards. 
Um, but that's the kind of folks that we're engaging all the time is to get their applications so we know how it works well. Now then we talk about the robotics part of that. Now, uh, Brad, they got to talk to as part of Blue River, right? That's our tech company. Um, oh, so you have those, a separate company? It's a deer company. Um, okay. So what they have though is to be able to take this autonomy stack that you're seeing on all of this equipment um, that's here. Actually, uh, the visual processing unit that we have over there on the stand, that's a part of every product that you're seeing here on the show. I like it, today, I like it. As well as the cameras. So not only do we get to put this in application and learn that robotics, we have got some sharp folks, Brad included, um, that know robotics well, they know autonomy well, and we get to learn from all these different applications across the enterprise, and all these teams of folks that you see here, we're able to share and build that knowledge and move very rapidly in developing autonomous products. So how many how many people do you have working on this stuff? In Blue River, so is everybody in Blue River, the John Deere company? It, it's a mix. Um, so definitely Blue River helps us on our uh, software and our applications folks, but we've got lots of folks all over the company. I mean, it, it would be hundreds of folks that are tied in different aspects of these products to be able to bring everything together. How do you even, Segway did the same thing, except they're coming from the other side. They're a robotics company making a mower. They have uh, Navimo is kind of their robotic lawnmower sector. But then even beneath that, I think it's like another, it's another, uh, I, don't, I don't fully understand how they've divided that up. So how do you like share resources in terms of like people, I guess, would be the first thing? Yeah, so I think that's what's really neat about how Deer works. Uh, so we certainly, like myself, I'm dedicated to this product, and we have several others who be dedicated to this product. But others that are here in the show is a great example of how we're able to leverage knowledge and work together as a team. So even though we may not be assigned to another product, um, we work together regularly to be like, hey, what, what do you know? What kind of challenges are you facing? Uh, we'll do the same and be able to leverage that knowledge. But I'd also highlight too, um, as part of a company like Deer, we also have all the behind the scenes stuff available too, like yeah, yeah. to be able to manufacture these, to be able to have reliable oh, yeah. supply base, um, all of those supporting functions that are around there that maybe aren't like first and, and center, are you but are critical to have. Speaking about manufacturing, where do you manufacture? All of our commercial equipment and uh, our commercial mowing equipment and our golf mowing equipment is out of Fuquay, Verena, North Carolina, North Carolina. Uh, at, tur at Turf Care, so U.S. made. So it's U.S. made. That is definitely different from all the other robot companies. I mean, Asians everywhere. Uh, pretty much all the companies I've seen are, are pretty much based out of China. So that is that is a reason in and of itself to, to give, you know, an autonomous mower by John Deere a second look is it's... U.S. made, U.S. designed. What about your engineers? Are they? Well, it's, it's, I'm not. A, I'm not offended if they're from Denmark or China or wherever. I'm just curious. Yeah, I. I think what's also really neat about this is is we're global. Um, of course, I sit uh, North Carolina. Like I sit at the factory and work there. Our prototyping. I mean, I, I was a part of hand building this machine there oh, in, in North Carolina. It's <laughs> it's, it's fun. Um, but I work with team members across the globe: India, Germany. Uh, Mexico, like all over yeah. the, the world and all over the United States, um, we're all able to work together and contribute. Here's another hard question, and what's taking so long? If you got all these great people working on it, why can't I buy one of these? It's always the infamous question. Uh, <laughs> we'd always like to go faster, so um, I don't know. It's just it, it's just us working uh, through. I think what I would highlight is. Um, we want to do it right. Um, so you'll notice, well, actually right here, you know, real autonomy for landscapers. So we don't want to just put it out there as soon as it go. Like, we could just deploy this right now, but we want to make sure that when we deploy it, it's the right product and it does it well. Uh, it, it represents what John Deere has been uh, for almost 200 years. That's fair, that's fair. I think one final thing, I don't see an e-stop. Am I just missing it? How do you stop this thing? If it's bearing down on you, your software is malfunctioned, like, how do you actually stop it? Or are you that confident? Like, is it intrinsically safe? Well, for development purposes, we will have a remote controlled e-stop. Oh, like a dead um, man switch type deal? Yeah, I got you. Uh, okay. We have one of those for development purposes, but as we go forward, um, that wouldn't be a part of it. So you'd, you'd have an app available through Op Center uh, to be able to pause or stop operation. 
Um, but we're building out that obstacle detection system to have the confidence that it's going to be able to detect people and obstacles that it needs to stop for. Are there, and this is me not knowing, are there like uh, international standards for how you implement like safe vision? Because I know vision in and of itself is not, I, I'm from industrial automation myself and you don't use cameras for safety. Like I remember when we made the shift to LiDAR being able to be safe um, mm -hmm. and that was a big deal. Are we there now where, where you know, international safety organizations are trusting cameras to that, to that level? It's certainly being worked out. Uh, so there's not, you know, I, I couldn't point you to like, hey, go look at this standard, this section, and here's your number, you do that, we're ready to go. Yeah. Um, but we certainly take a lot of pride internally at setting up those abilities that we can be uh, provably safe. We have the numbers behind uh, how well our uh, classification models work and all of that so that we can that we can prove and be confident in that safety. Yeah, and I, you know, honestly, that's one of my concerns. I mentioned that third kind of class of companies that they're, you know, college kids that have, you know, throwing together a robot just because they can, they don't have that experience that I would imagine you have, or as much to lose. You know, if they just started a company even three years ago, you know, their brand doesn't really mean anything. So if, if you know, something does something unsafe, God forbid, you know, cut somebody's foot off or something like that, it's, you know, uh, for John Deere, that would be a much bigger deal. So um, I, I definitely respect that. Um, you know, it's a different, it's a different power dynamic for sure. So. Yeah, um, take your time, but don't take too long because I really want to see this thing out and uh, I'm sure a lot of commercial people do as well. Do we have a rough uh, price point and timeline? Uh, we haven't released it for the autonomous part of that uh, okay. yet. Now, we also, we're also we looking for 2026 specifically for the electric part of this. So um, do a quick shout out for like Equip Expo you may have seen in the last uh, couple of years. We've had our electric product out there. Oh, okay. um, and across the company, we're looking to have electric products in a lot of those product lines. Uh, by 2026. Okay. Uh, so we'll be looking to have some of that. And then, so this is all electric, right? I, I forgot to. It is. How, yeah. how many kilowatt hours or whatever is your battery? Um, we have 21 and a half approximately available mm. on this. Okay. Uh, kilowatt hours. That does not sound cheap. Um, okay. Cool. And uh, no price point yet, or any ballpark idea? We haven't released any yet. We're still working our way through that. I think Brad was saying the electric part, not autonomous, was getting close to 20 grand uh well we haven't we haven't released on the uh base electric so we've oh, certainly seen okay. um quite a variety that's been out there in the market uh today but we haven't released any official pricing on the uh, base electric or autonomous yet okay anything else we should know about like aftercare support like warranty um anything anything else about this that you think would differentiate yourself from from other offerings out there i think electric sheep is somebody else um Who's the other one? Nexmo has like a bunch of little ones that go out. Like what? Sure. Any other differentiators? Yeah. I, if I were going to leave you uh, with anything here or, or uh, anybody watching this too, is just um, this is going to represent what you'd expect out of John Deere. So we're looking for a product that can perform the job well. It's going to hold up well uh, and be able to deliver on what professional landscapers are going to look for out of a Deere product. Uh, and that comes along with reliability, dur durability, performance. Uh, you mentioned after, after, um, after care. Uh, after, yeah, after care. Um, with support, warranty, all of that kind of stuff that you would expect from John Deere is gonna be uh, what comes along with this product. Um, this is more on a personal note. Dealership, um, I, I'm mostly a dealer for the smaller, like consumer grade guys, but is there a, a venue for, for me to become a dealer for you guys? Are you pretty much just sticking with uh, uh, you know, already existing John Deere dealers? Really good questions. That one ventures a little bit out of my area of expertise. Okay. So I might have to get you in touch with one of the one of the PR folks to see if they can get you with the right, right folks for that one. Okay, sounds good. Well, thank you again, yeah, Tim. Yeah, absolutely. Thanks, Isaac. And um, looking forward to seeing this thing out yep. uh, in, a, in a yard near you. Um, so yep. thanks again. Yep, appreciate I'll it. that. Thank you. In a yard near you. <laughs> I like it. That was a good one. So yeah, absolutely.